Let us resume the public worship of God, and we do so as we turn to sing in Psalm 105. We're going to sing tonight from 105 and 106, psalms that recount for us the history of Israel in Old Testament times, their ups and their downs. We're singing just now from verse 5, and we'll sing down to verse 10. Alistair, how did you? Read this one, please. Psalm 105 from verse 5. Think on the works that he had done, which admiration breed, his wonders and the judgments all which from his mouth proceed. O ye that are of Abram's race, his servant well approved, and ye that Jacob's children are, whom he chose for his own. Because he and he only is the mighty God, thou Lord, the mighty Lord our God. His most righteous judgments are in all the earth abroad. His covenant he remembered hath with that it may ever stand. To a thousand generations the word he did command. Which covenant he firmly made with faithful Abraham. And unto Isaac by his oath he did renew the same. And unto Jacob for a law he made it firm and sure. A covenant to Israel which ever should endure. And you notice that reference. Um, it's repeated actually in 9, 8, 9, and 10, this reference to God's covenant relationship with his people. Now, that covenant had two sides to it. There were privileges, but there were also accompanying responsibilities. From 5, think on the works that he had done. <laughs> Amen. 
one ear on this Lord's Day evening, at the hour of evening worship, we come seeking help and leading of the Spirit in every aspect of our worship and indeed in every area of our lives. For we are so weak and so frail, so inconsistent, coming so far short. Thy word reminds us that without thee we can do nothing. And how very true that is. We can do nothing and the things that we do will, uh, will not amount to anything if we do them without the Lord's help and without the Lord's blessing. We know that it is true that only that which is done for Jesus lasts. Everything else passes away with us and it is soon gone. And we are soon gone with it. What is our life but a vapor? What is a generation or two? How soon we will be out of memory and how soon people will forget that we were ever here. We pray eternal Lord then that we would use our time well, that we would count our days and that we would apply our hearts to wisdom for we are walking on the very edge of eternity. We never know the moment when we will be called into it. Help us then to cease the day and to cease the hour and to cease the gospel which is set before us. For if we do not, what excuse, what possible excuse can we be? We pray thy blessing, Lord, then upon each one of us, each home, each family, all our loved ones, we bring them to thee and our cares, we lay them before thee. We pray for young and old. We pray for those who are unwell. We pray for those who have known bereavement in our community in recent days. As we have remembered them already today, we remember them again. We remember any with problems, issues, and concerns that fill their lives and that eh, fill them with differ with sorrow and uncertainty. Undertake, O oh Lord, pardon. Undertake for thy people, Lord, whether amongst us or wherever they are found, who are struggling, struggling in their spiritual lives, struggling with temptations, struggling with uh, issues that uh, are so complicated and complex. Uh, we pray that they might discover that they can do all things through Christ that strengthens them, that the joy of the Lord proves to be their strength, and that by his grace they overleap many walls. We pray thy blessing, Lord, upon the work of the gospel in the congregation. We Pray for blessing upon the word as it's preached so that people will be swept into the kingdom of Christ and that God's people will be built up in the faith, that they will grow in knowledge and understanding, that they will grow in hope and grow in love, and that their lives will reflect the glory of the one who called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. We pray for any who are on the fence and sitting on the fringes of the gospel, who are not sure indeed where they lie, in regard to the things of the gospel, who have thoughts and longings and desires that they cannot share and perhaps cannot articulate. Uh, but we pray, Lord, that into such and into those who are fearful and uncertain might come the word of God and its grace and in its power and in its great encouragement. We pray, eternal Lord, for the uh, blessing of God to rest upon the congregations of our presbytery and the presbyteries of our church. We pray for our overseas work in France and Spain. We pray for the work in Sri Lanka and its current unsettled state. And we are thankful that thus far the unsettled a social situation there has not touched the areas in which our work is concentrated. We pray that that might continue, that they might know protection and safety and that they might know access to food and to the necessities of life as well. We pray, Lord, for the wider mission work of the church, that great missionary work to the Jews who proclaim that their Messiah has come. Blessed, O oh Lord, and grant that the day may come when we see the promises of God's word regarding them, 
brought into wonderful fruition. We pray for the Gentile world as it hears of the gospel of God's redeeming grace. Open ears, open hearts, open lives to the gospel so that we will see souls transformed. We will see people taken out of false religion and no religion at all and established on the rock that is Christ and made new creatures through him. Pray, Lord, for blessing upon the nation, upon government in, in Westminster and in Hollywood. And we pray, Lord, for those who govern us. We remember the Queen in her advanced years. And we, we are thankful for a, a measure of improvement in her health. And we, we are thankful for the stability that has marked uh, the years of her reign. And we pray, Lord, for the nation. It is a morally sick and it is morally confused. And all of that leads to great unsettlement and a removing of uh, uh, much that was good and a replacing of it with much that is not good. We are in a perilous state. We are in a poor state. And perhaps even in an economically unstable and poor state. We don't know what will come, but we acknowledge, O oh Lord, that generally the nation is determined to face it without God and indeed determined to talk him out of the public square and talk him out of his own universe if they could but manage that oh lord have mercy upon us and send reformation and revival send true repentance and bring us as a people whether governing or governed to a recognition that there is another king one jesus and that unless we follow his way we will walk in confusion and in darkness and stumble off him Oh, Lord, our God, have mercy upon us and turn the tide. Bless the gospel to that end up and down our land, whether within our own denomination or beyond. We pray for all who preach Christ and him crucified. We pray for the Lord's people who engaged in, in chaplaincy work, in prisons and in hospitals, in schools and in universities. We pray, Lord, for all who bring the influence of the gospel to bear, those who speak word of counsel and light to those who are in authority those who seek to be salt and light we pray for the work of the christian institute which has been before our minds this past week we pray for those who work there and those who direct its affairs give them wisdom give them grace give them that authority that is heaven sent give them a boldness and a winsomeness too. give them open doors of opportunity and turn those who are perhaps most opposed to all they say by God's grace to be upon their side, upon thy side, O oh Lord. We pray for legislation encroaching upon a family life. We pray for legislation that threatens to encroach upon the freedom to speak the word of God itself. We uh, pray for a legislation that would seek to limit the preaching of God's word and even the counseling and the pastoring of men and women. Lord, we pray that these things may not come about, but that in thy grace, the freedoms that we enjoy to preach and teach and speak to and counsel and pray with men and women may, may continue. And that indeed, not only will we have the outward privileges, but the accompanying power of God's spirit too. Be with us then as we come. We come with confession of sin. The confession of the sins of our hearts. Our failure to love the Lord our God with whole soul, heart, mind, strength. Our failure to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are, we are so full of subtle idolatry. We are so ready to treat the Lord casually and to uh, ignore him when it suits us. We are so inconsistent. We are so fickle. We are so full of pride and self-sufficiency, so reluctant at times to bow the knee to Christ and his sovereignty, so ready to reject his sovereign will and to grumble at his providential dealings with us, so lacking in love for our fellow men that we, we are silent when we should speak and we are cowardly when we should be bold. How little love we have for the souls of those around us, how how careless we are as to their uh, immortal and uh, never dying souls. How little it causes us concern that 
there is a broad way and that there are souls tramping upon it. Stir us up, O oh Lord, and give us a greater love for our fellow men, less selfishness, less self-centered in our attitudes and in our outlook, less covetous of others and less covetous of others' uh, providences, and more settled upon God and upon his way. Make us godly, give us depth, give us reality, deliver us from shallowness and religious things, deliver us from the superficial, deliver us from the outward obsession which we focused on already today, which the Pharisees were so, so caught up with, keeping the outward rules and uh, multiplying them and multiplying them again. And yet none of these things bringing peace with God, none of these things bringing reconciliation to God, none of these things bringing anything that was worth brought. Help us to see, to realize afresh tonight, to rejoice in the truth that our Lord came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, and grant that we would all be sinners repenting and turning and seeking and searching and finding. Hear our prayers and go before us. Lead us and guard us, not for our asking, but for Jesus' sake. Amen. We turn now to read in God's word and we're reading as we return to our studies and the acts of the apostles. We find ourselves in chapter seven, the acts of the apostles and chapter seven. Now you'll remember from last time we're taking up our reading at that point in the narrative where Stephen, having uh, done much in the service of the Lord, finds himself under arrest and it'll help actually if we read from verse 12 um, and even from verse 10 of chapter 6 we we'll read from verse 10 of chapter 6 and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he that is Stephen spoke and they suborned men in other words they they paid them they arranged for for them to come which said we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. And set up false witnesses which said, this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Then said the high priest, are these things so? And he said, men, brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. And came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spoke on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob and Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and great afflictions. 
and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known to Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, three score and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulchre that Abraham bought for the sum of money of the sons of Amor, the father of Shechem. When the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. And another king arose which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer a wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his word would deliver them. They understood not. And the next day he showed himself to them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, your brethren, why do you wrong one another? He that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? If thou kill me as thou killst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And for 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire and a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I'm come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel, which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out, after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet, shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall you hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel, which spoke to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers, who received the lively oracles given to us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of them. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice to the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. O ye house of Israel, have you offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Yea, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God Rempen, Figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking to Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus or Joshua into the possession of the Gentiles, 
and God drove out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now, the betrayers and the murderers, who, having received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. As far we trust the Lord to follow with his own blessing that reading of his word. We sing again to God's praise in Psalm 105. Singing this time from verse 16, verses that recount some of the history that we read of there, particularly that of Joseph in these verses. We're singing from 16 to 23, the call for famine on the land. He called for famine on the Oh. 
Well, friends, seeking the light of God's word, we turn again to that passage that we read, the <clears throat> Acts of the Apostles, and we'll read just now at the beginning of chapter 7, and we'll take that as our connecting link. Then said the high priest, are these things so? And he said, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken, and so on. You will remember that on the last occasion we saw in the second half of chapter 6, Stephen appearing before his accusers. They were furious at the gospel that he was preaching and also furious at the success that that gospel was enjoying. And through that fury, a wave of persecution is unleashed, which is referred to in verse 1 of chapter 8 and uh, had huge implications for the early New Testament church. Now here in verses 2 to 53, Stephen is responding to the accusations that were made. The accusations were very, very serious. And here's his response. And on the face of it, I don't know about you, but on the face of it, it appears to be a very strange response. Stephen doesn't seem to answer the, the question of verse 1 or even address directly the accusations that were leveled against him in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 6. And instead of that, instead of meeting head on what he's been accused of and dealing with it eh, perhaps piece by piece the way we might, Instead of that, Stephen gives what, what appears on the surface to be just a lengthy historical sermon, going all the way back to Abraham and then coming down through the generations. And only after, what is it, 49 uh, verses or 50 verses of this sermon, only then, and pretty briefly, in verses 51, 52, and 53, does he speak directly to his audience. But the Lord has preserved this sermon in considerable detail. It's, it's very unusual. Many of the New Testament sermons and discourses are at best summarized for us. Many of them aren't even summarized. But some of them are, and they're summarized in a couple of verses. But here we have 52 verses recounting what he said. So it's obvious that we are to consider carefully what Stephen said. It's obvious that it was important. Now, preaching through the book of Acts or through the early chapters, which is really what this study is, was relatively straightforward up to this point because we were, we were taking event after event. But when I came to the end of chapter 6, I faced a problem. And my problem was, how do I deal with Stephen's sermon? Now, there's a dozen sermons in Stephen's sermon. Whether we take it section by section or just take themes out of it. There's a dozen sermons here, probably. But I don't want to do that. Because we will lose the momentum of what we are engaged in here. 
So I'm going to spend just tonight on the sermon. And then if we're spared, we shall come to the reaction to the sermon next week. Now I want to try to summarize what Stephen is saying and I'm going to focus on three points. Three things that Stephen is doing here in this sermon. I want us to notice, first of all, that in this sermon, Stephen reminds them of their privileges. Stephen reminds them of their privileges. He doesn't begin by defending himself or, or saying anything about Christ or the resurrection. Not a word about that initially. But he begins by reminding them of the many privileges that they had enjoyed. And he goes all the way back to their beginning as a nation. He starts with Abraham. And he recalls for them the way God sovereignly called this man out of spiritual darkness and out of the Chaldees, brought him ultimately into the land of promise, and more importantly, into a living relationship with the Lord himself. Abraham was wonderfully saved, and he came by God's grace to live a life of faith, and as a result, blessings flow down through the centuries. Because of these beginnings, because God had so been so kind to them, they had, for example, the Old Testament scriptures with all their promise and teaching. They had the worship of God instituted among them, first around the tabernacle, and then later around the temple. And even when that temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, God in his grace took them back again. A second temple was built. They had all of these blessings. And then he mentions in verse 18 that God had made a covenant with them. What a blessing that was. And furthermore, he had given them a sign of the covenant that they were to put on the physical seed. Later on in verses 44, he mentions the tabernacle and the temple. He's reminding them about their privileges. I'm not going to say any more about these privileges, but I'm just going to apply it, and I'll do it in a sentence. We, too, are privileged. We're privileged in, in many, many different ways. We're privileged even in ordinary life. We, we enjoy peace and order and stability, which huge parts of the world do not. But putting all of that to one side, we are extraordinarily privileged spiritually. We have the word of God in our own language. We have it Old and New Testament. We have a place of worship. We have the, the, these regular services of worship. The Lord's Day, midweek, Saturday, we have, we have all of these things. There are people in the world who would give their right arm for these things. What have we done with our privileges? Stephen is going to apply this directly to them. He's going to, he's going to ask them how they've, how they've dealt with these privileges. What have we done with our privileges? What are we doing with them? Christian, what are you doing with your privileges? You remember the Lord speaks of, of the parable of the talents and the improving of these talents. And there was a man who put it in the earth and hid it. Maybe you're not a believer. What are you doing with these privileges? Maybe you're very young. Maybe you're still in school. Friend, you have privileges. Go into Sabbath school there in the hall. 
You have all these blessings. You have Bibles at home. You have the word of God. What are you doing for the privileges of God? Do we just take them for granted? First of all, Stephen reminds them about their privileges. But then secondly, Stephen challenged them about their history. What did they do with all that God gave them? From Abraham right up to the time of Christ. How faithful were Israel down through the centuries? Well, the truth is, as we know, that they weren't faithful at all. And Stephen demonstrates that in several different ways. He highlights at least three failures. Three failures. First of all, he highlights a failure to follow God's word. Now, if there was a people on earth who should follow God's word, it was Israel. Nobody had the word of God as they had it. And with privilege comes responsibility. We would expect them to have followed it carefully and meticulously and consistently, to have applied it and to have been a light to the nations as they were meant to be. But failure to follow God's word, active disobedience against God's word had been the story over and over and over again. Stephen reminds them how soon they had turned from the Lord. Verse 41, he speaks of, of them making the golden calf. Didn't take them long. Didn't take them a hundred years after they left Egypt to, to fall into idolatry. It barely took them a hundred days. In fact, it didn't. Before the seeds of idolatry were planted in their hearts. They were accusing Stephen of trying to destroy the worship of God. Stephen is showing them that they were the ones who had repeatedly done that. Showing them that they had failed to follow God's word. And if God examines us today, what will he find? What will he find in your heart, in your life? Obedience, partial obedience, shocking disobedience. You're not a believer, perhaps. What will he find? What have you done with Christ? How have you responded to him? to his claims, to his call, to his grace. Maybe you are a believer. How is your life? There was a failure to follow God's word. Secondly, there was a failure to understand God's plan. Stephen demonstrates to them that all Old Testament history was gradual. God didn't reveal the plan of redemption on day one. He didn't explain to Adam and Eve immediately what was going to happen. They weren't ready for that. They weren't remotely ready for it. He gave them a promise and that's all he said. And then slowly, 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 he reveals the plan of redemption. It took centuries. Well, you would think when it's done so slowly that they would grasp it, but they didn't grasp it at all. He's unfolding. He's revealing his plans for salvation. He's saying a savior is coming. A savior is coming. This is what he'll be like. That's what he'll be like. 
bit by bit by bit, all the way up to that moment when in royal David's city, he is born to his king of kings. And they fail to understand. They failed to grasp that all the promises of the Old Testament, all the symbols of the Old Testament were centered firmly on the person and work of the promised Savior. God's glory had one great focus, the coming of Christ. But when he came, as we'll see in a moment, they rejected him. And the very men who were accusing Stephen of sin were guilty, as he's going to tell them in verse 51, of a far greater sin themselves. And you say, how does that apply to me? Well, it applies to this extent anyway. How well do we understand God's plan? How much do we trust God's purposes? I wonder. So there's a failure to follow God's word. There's a failure to understand God's plan. Thirdly, and perhaps most devastatingly, there was a failure to respect God's servants. As you look at Stephen's sermon, you begin to notice something. There's a particular emphasis on two people in the Old Testament. And I don't mean Abraham. He mentions Abraham at the beginning. But he focuses on two other people in the history of Israel. And we might say, why? The two, of course, are Joseph and Moses. And Considerable periods in the sermon are given to both. Why does he focus on Joseph and Moses? Well, as you look at the passage, it becomes very obvious what Stephen is doing. Your forefathers they rejected Joseph, they rejected Moses, the servants of God, and you, he says, have done exactly the same with Jesus. This is really the killer blow in his sermon. The failure to understand God's plan. That was serious. The failure to obey God's word, that was obviously serious. But rising up to cap it all is the failure to respect God's servants. In fact, Stephen says, Moses told you. Moses of whom you make so much. Moses who is your figurehead. Moses of whom you boast. Moses told you that God would raise up a prophet like me, verse 37. And when he comes, Moses said, make sure you receive him. They did the very opposite. They rejected him. And they didn't stop rejecting him until they crucified him. As failures go, it was catastrophic. Just like their fathers, they had failed to recognize and to respect God's servants. Only on this occasion, the error was far, far worse. Because they hadn't just rejected Joseph or Moses. The servant they rejected was none other than God's eternal son. And as God judges us and measures us, this is the greatest 
crime of all. A rejection of his son. The rest is serious. But this is extraordinarily super serious. This is in a league all of its own. Look at the parallels that he makes between Joseph, Moses, and, and Jesus. There's a, there's a whole sermon here. I'll have to do it in, in two or three minutes. For example, Joseph. He is the delight of his father. Oh, they couldn't miss the point he was making. God sent his son, the delight of his heart, the one whom he loved. The delight of his father is met with jealous hostility. And he was speaking to the very men whose jealous hostility had poured out against Christ. And they didn't stop until as far as they were concerned, he was dead and gone. I mean, Joseph. He didn't stop until then. Come, let us kill him. No, let's not shed his blood ourselves. Let's, let's get somebody else to do it. Let's, let's murder him by proxy. We'll sell him. He'll be a slave. He won't last any length of time. He'll be dead, but we didn't actually physically do it. The parallel is obvious. They take Christ and he is arrested. And they don't stop. They don't stop until they pressure the Roman authorities. They turn up at Pilate. And they turn up the heat. They say, you've got to put him to death. Well, he says, I don't find him guilty of death. Ah, they said, we have a law. And by our law, he ought to die. They keep turning up the heat. We have no king but Caesar. He made himself a king. What do you have to say about that? Pilate, friend of Caesar. Eventually, he caves in. There's the little charade with the, the washing of hands. If only it was so easy, Pilate. If only. They thought he was dead and gone. But the Joseph who they thought was dead and gone wasn't dead and gone at all. One day they had to meet him. One day they stood. The man they knew as the austere governor of Egypt. Drop that astonishing bombshell. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. And that one who was rejected and killed effectively, he is the one who feeds them. And who saves them. And who guards them. And who becomes their redeemer. In the hour of famine. Mm -hmm. The parallel is so obvious. <laughs> and then he turns to Moses. Moses, who is dismissed in verse 27, who is rejected, his help rebuffed. It's the same Moses who leads them out of the bondage of Egypt and to the borders of a promised land. The parallel is obvious. He focuses on these two types of Christ in the Old Testament. As he builds his sermon. This isn't a, a wandering, meandering discourse through thousands of years of history. No, here's a man 
who is discovering in his hour of need what Jesus had promised his people. When, they, when you stand before the authorities, I'll give you the words. He gives him the words. And he crafts this remarkable address, which leaves them with nowhere to turn. In both cases, they reject and despise and mistreat the one who became the deliverer and the savior. Our Christian friend, was it not so? How long we despised and rejected and mistreated and wandered away from the one who became your savior. How humble you ought to be, how penitent you ought to be, how faithful you ought to be. If after all of that, he has received you and saved you and reconciled you to himself by his death, no less, no less. What consistency, what humility, what long suffering. What patience, what trust should be yours. And if it be perchance that this applies from another side to you, and that you are still rejecting and refusing the one who is appointed a savior, How long can that continue? Realistically. Maybe you have tested God's patience. Maybe you have really, really tested God's patience. Well, there's a boundary between God's patience and God's wrath, and it's a hidden line, and we cross it, and we don't even know we're crossing it. Stephen reminds them of their privileges. He challenges them about their history, their failure to follow God's word, to understand God's plan, to respect God's servants. Thirdly, Stephen confronts them about their sins. Once he's catalogued their failings, once he's reminded them of their privileges, once he's made unmistakable parallels between Old Testament folk and themselves, he says in verse 51, no, he doesn't mince his words, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears. He's a man under arrest. This could go either way. He's like a liar. He's bold as a liar. In the best sense. Ah, oh, you say, I can't do this and I can't do that. Look at Stephen and realize that God's promise to his people is true when he says that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. If you had told Stephen, perhaps weeks, months before, years before, one day you will stand before the Jewish authorities, before the high council, and you will speak to them in the most direct way. You have said, never, never. Unbelief says never. Faith dusts herself down and says, by God's grace, why not? He says in verse 51, 
that um, they had resisted God's spirit. In verse 52, they had rejected God's sake. And it had all led to the events at the end of verse 52. You are now betrayers and murderers. They had even failed by their own standards. We saw this morning. And there's a bit of a parallel between Mark 2 and this, this chapter. Which I didn't realize until I started working on it. We saw this morning how much the scribes and the Pharisees made of the law. 613 principal commandments with all the little bylaws they had. They don't even manage to live by the standards. They, they, they prided themselves on keeping the law. Verse 53, you received the law and you have not kept it. You failed dismally. And who of us, who of us can say that somewhere along the line, Stephen hasn't touched a raw nerve? Well, we're told in verse 52, verse 54, how all this went down, and it went down very badly. Before the chapter closed, Stephen's sermon is going to cost him his life. It's his last sermon. And oh, it was a good one. And we do wonder if the Lord blessed it. Because later on, we're going to be introduced to somebody else. In verse 58. They cast him out of the city and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Why are we told his name? We're told his name because we're meant to know it. Ah, Saul. Chapter 9, Saul, yet breathing threatenings and slaughter. He heard that sermon. He heard something of what was said. He at least saw Stephen's death. How do we respond when God's word challenges us? Puts us in a corner, in a tight place. When it confronts us with privilege and responsibility and reminds us that not one of us in pulpit or pew begin to measure up. How do we respond? Well, I hope we don't respond in the way they respond in verse 54. They were cut to the heart. That's a good thing. But they gnash their teeth. They can hardly restrain themselves. Fury was in their face. <laughs> Who's really rejecting God's word, says Stephen? It's not me, it's you. But the same Stephen is stressing the importance of turning to Christ or perishing in their sins. Now, if we're spiritual next time, we'll go into the reaction to all of this. But your eye just has to fall on that verse I read to get a good idea of this, that there's trouble coming. How do we respond to the gospel? How do we respond to the challenges of God's word? How do we respond to our sins being highlighted? Do we close our ears? Do we close our hearts? And all Christians have said again and again tonight, don't think this doesn't apply to you. We can be as blind and as complacent as anybody else as resistant to the voice of correction as anyone else. Well, they heard, they heard a good sermon. 
We don't know what they did with it long term, but we know that many of them did not make the use of it they should have. When God speaks, we should listen. When God calls, we should respond. And it doesn't really matter whether the sermon itself is good, bad, or indifferent. It's the word of God with all that's upon it. And may God bless it. Let's pray. Bless thy word, O Lord, we pray. And help us to see where Stephen is challenging ourselves, our thoughts, our motives, our responses. Where which part of our lives he is shining a light on as he preaches his last sermon. Soon after that sermon, he would be in glory. Oh Lord, our God, we give thanks for its preservation. We're still hearing it 2,000 years later. Grant that it might know blessing even 2,000 years later. And that Stephen's sermon might be used even now to edify and advance the people of God. And that it might be used to bring men and women to a realization of their need before God. And bring them to himself. Bless that sermon of Stephen. And grant that we may remember it and ponder it. And that we may look back and give thanks to God that Stephen preached that sermon. Bless thy word and go before us. Pardoning sin for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to sing now in the next psalm, at verse 43. We'll sing to the end of the psalm. Verses that, yes, speak of their failure, but yet it ends on a high note. God gathering, God saving, and them praising. From verse 43, he many times delivered them. 106. He many times delivered. 
Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, rest on and abide with you all now and forevermore.